ES Audio. Hello, I'm Lawrence Delalio. Welcome to my rugby podcast. It's been another exciting and dramatic weekend of rugby, so there's plenty to talk about. But before we do, let me introduce uh, my stellar guest list. From the Evening Standard, we have the sports journalist Simon Collins. Simon, welcome. Joining us all the way from Toulouse in the south of France, I'm delighted to welcome my friend and former international Thomas Castagnier, who, of course, also spent many happy years at Saracens. And finally, Tom Council, who is a lifelong supporter of Bath Rugby and host the Bath Rugby Plug uh, podcast, which we'll be finding out a little bit more later in the show. Tom, um, it's been a tough season for Bath. Um, uh, you know, you've, you're, you're, a, you're a good man for, uh, for sticking with it. But uh, Thomas, for, if I can start with you, my friend, um, the Five Nations, the Six Nations is back. Um, you have some amazing memories of, uh, of playing in the, in the tournament. Uh, I think I remember my, one of my first games for, um, for England uh, against uh, France in the uh, Stade, de, Stade de France. Or it no, may be... Parc, Parc de France. Parc de France. Yeah. And uh, uh, I think uh, you scored the winning drop goal. You had a, a beautiful blonde... Uh, Blonde hair at the time. Um, I mean, what are your what are your earliest memories of, of playing for France and and playing in the Five Nations? Well, it's um, it's 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 always good memories because you come from watching the games, you know, in your sofa when you're a kid, you know, and dreaming about maybe one day playing for your country, and uh, the the dream uh, um, became reality. And uh, and to be honest, I will always remember when uh, when uh, when I was in the in the corridor, you know, going on, on the field, on, on the field. And I, and I saw all the faces about your friends, of your friends, you know, were playing for England at this time, Roundtree, Reagan, Johnson, and they were very, very ugly, you know? And I thought to myself, oh my God, if I go in a rug, this guy, you know, they, were, they are going to kill me. So I was only thinking about running around the rugs and not talking so much, you know? And, 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 I, and I never understood you as a, as a running man, you know, how you could play with this kind of guys, you know, so because you, you were flying on the pitch. Well, I, I think, um, as you know, rugby is about celebrating difference. You know, it bring, <laughs> brings, us, uh, brings us all together. Tell me, um, uh, when you woke up this morning, there, mu there must be a very good feeling in France about, uh, about the team, about the match, about the possibilities, about uh, the future. It's, uh, what, you know, what, is, what are the people saying after, after yeah. yesterday's match? I think I think the French uh, the French crowd is really proud because I think we had many years where we struggled a lot and um, we we had some disappointment. We it was hard to find a team and to find some um, you know, some consistency in the in the in the performance. And uh, we everyone believed that this team is really one of the best team uh, in France we had. You know, in the probably ever. You know, we I think we are very powerful. We got some strength in the forwards, you know, which was the quality of the French team before. And, 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 and behind that, we got some players like um, Dupont and Tamak who are very creative. Mm. And in the back line, we don't have the, you know, this magic was, you know, before in, in the French back line, but we had some uh, like uh, hard workers, you know, who can really tackle hard, you know, put pressure on defence. And, and I think every team who's playing against the French team now is really scared about the physicality that we can put into the game because we played against a very good Irish team. Yeah, Simon, um, for you, I'm, I'm assuming you, you, you caught that game. It, it, for me, you know, across the championship, I don't mean you know, any disrespect to the other teams, but this, this match uh, was, was a different level to, uh, to maybe uh, what we've seen in the, in the tournament so far. Um, the two best teams, and as Thomas said, Ireland contributed to a you know, fantastic match. You know, when you concede in the, in the first few minutes of, of the game, you know, Dupont, coming up with, uh, you know, the opening try. What, what was your impressions of, of, uh, of the game and, and the way that both sides played? Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think this was, in terms of the rugby we've seen so far in the championship, the highest quality. And, and the main thing for me was the physicality and, you know, the power and pace that these teams were playing at. And right from the start, we, we saw it with DuPont and France. But I think a lot of credit's got to go to Ireland because start of that second half, you were wondering... You know, this, this, they could fade here. We know what the French crowd is like when it gets up and the team's going forward, but they really did fight back. And I think as much as it's going to be a mouth-watering game when, when we get to see England play France, I think England-Ireland as well should, should be brilliant because this Irish team that Andy Fowler's made will not roll over for anyone. And even in the heat of Paris and 
coming up against a French team like that. They really, really fought well. But France, for me, just looking like the favourites and as we're building up to a World Cup, uh, the momentum really seems behind that team. Thomas, um, you know, you, you obviously won, won uh, many uh, Six Nations titles, Five Nations titles with France. They, they probably should have won the tournament. Not last. as much as you did, but, uh, you know, not, not too far. <laughs> it took me a long time, to be fair. <laughs> yes. um, they, they, France probably should have won the title last year. Um, somehow they managed to lose the last game against Wales. They probably should have won the, the title the year before. Um, so there's obviously a lot of pressure coming into, into this year's championship, but they seem to have, have handled that you know, incredibly well. Uh, they seem you know, really um, full of uh, confidence, some of the best players in the world in, in the back line. Uh, and and you know, as you say, they found some forwards. But um, would, you, would you expect them now to, to go on and, uh, and win this uh, Grand Slam and, and claim the title? Yeah, but that all comes, I think, from uh, French rugby. French rugby clubs, you know, was improving massively too. And um, we had the Toulouse who won uh, the, the, the European Cup uh, with many French players. So these players, they, it's a new generation of confidence. Uh, playing in the French Championship is always hard. And, um, and you can see that in the European Cup. Like the French team are very strong, very powerful. So every game is like... A, nearly an international game. So I think the players were really improving. Um, the game we had against New Zealand uh, in November was really key because we realized that we can uh, compete against the best. Um, I think we got a generation of new young players who are really, um, really uh, fascinating. And, and I think the coaching staff has made a, a fantastic work, work too. I think Fabien Galtier, who was struggling a bit as, as, as a coach when he, when he was a, a, a coach for a club, you know, but I think he's more a coach you know, for, for an international team because he's not like something who can um, share, you know, his, uh, his feelings and he's not someone who can share his feelings and all that, but he's, he's, he's someone who knows about rugby, he's someone who can build, you know, a project. And I think having the players only like two weeks during, or, or five weeks, you know, during a the season, then another five weeks, you know, it, it's really helped. And I think the confidence is there. And, and, and we got some, some guys, especially in the forwards, I say, who are really tremendous and very powerful. And we miss one of our, uh, of our main threat, I think, which is Bakatawa, who can play the center. He's still injured, but when he will come back, I think he will bring something more into the French team too. So I think the potential is there. And, and, but we need to protect Dupont, which is, I think, key in everywhere because he can do the dark job. He can bring everyone forward in key moments. When, when games are easy, well, you don't see him so much because he's, he's, you know, he's, he's not someone who, can, who wants to show all the time. But when it's hard, you know, he's always there. And this guy is really unbelievable. Yeah, no, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and uh, I think, uh, is it Cameron Wokey? Yeah. Um, I mean, what a player, man. But what you, a player. I, I think you agree. And what I think is, some, is a bit different bet between the French team and, for example, the English team. When I watch the English team, they play uh, second row in back row. Yeah. Whereas the French team is doing exactly the opposite. We play some back rows in second rows. And I think Woki was a second, who was a back row, you know, we've decided, like Leroux, we decided to put him as, as second row because what we want, we want back rowers. We want people who can really fight on the rucks. And if you got slow players, you know, on the field, then you cannot compete against the best. And I think the quality of the French team now is that we've got players who can really move really quickly on the field. And these guys, you know, are powerful. They bring some speed into the game and, and, and in the forwards and in the backs, because on the wings, we got like two back rowers, you know, some Perno and, and Villiers, you know, they fight so hard. I think, I think even, a, even a forward, you know, when he, when he goes into them, you know, he knows he will struggle. And I think these guys, you know, can bring something special. And in the end, we got a kicker. Finally, we got someone who can kick the penalties. I missed a lot, you know, and all the French the fly <laughs> half, you know, because it's, it's not the best, the first quality that they has to a French uh, a player. But, uh, but, you know, with uh, Jaminet, you know, we got someone who can kick all the time and can kick, you know, in key moments because that was important when we were leading like only 22-21. It was only because the kicker made the job before that. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. I still have this uh, picture in my head, Tom, of uh, Sean Edwards coaching the, the, the French team with his, uh, with his sort of wig and act. I mean, he is one of, he's a very special individual. Um, and obviously, uh, Rafael Ibanez is... Uh, is there with the, the team manager and they seem to have put together 
uh, a really um, a really strong coaching group and the, and the chemistry between them and the players is is working very well what, what what were your impressions of the game from a from a french and an irish perspective yeah i think i think for france it's it's incredibly impressive what they're building i mean we shouldn't understate kind of the the scale of the the squad overhaul that they they undertook a couple of years ago obviously bringing in a lot of young talent and a lot of guys who were kind of over 30 were kind of kind of moved out from from that squad but as you say, Sean Edwards deserves a huge amount of credit because I think if you look over recent Six Nations and recent World Cups for France, the attacking ability has never really been in doubt. The ability to, to score tries has always been there. But I think what really impressed me against Ireland was just how ferocious the, the defence was throughout the, the full 80 minutes. Um, you know, obviously, plaudits go to Dupont, Entomac, Villiers, etc. In, in the back line. But I think guys like Paul Willemsey and even Uni Antonio in the in the front row, I think they were they were ferocious, and I think that's something that that Galtier and that that Sean Edwards have have really added to to France. Just from 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 an Irish perspective, you know they nearly managed to get back into the game at the end. There, they 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 were quite close. I and, and though I don't think Joey Carberry had a bad game by any means, I think. Ireland really do miss Johnny Sexton when he's when he's not fit and firing. I mean, his ability to manage the game through his kicking and also to to take the ball to the line um, as, as an attacking threat, I think is is huge for them. So, if I was an Irish fan, I'd be I'd be fairly worried about his his longevity, given obviously his his age and how how injury prone he's he's become. No, I mean, listen, I think Ireland still have a, a lot of positives to take from uh, from the match. I think they played fantastically well. Thomas, I'm, I'm interested to, to understand um, who was behind bringing Sean Edwards into uh, the French setup. I, 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 I think I think I think you know about that. I think it's 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 Raphael and uh, who I think knew from wasps when you were there. You know that the quality of the guy um, <laughs> playing with Saracens against wasps wasn't easy, especially when he was the defensive coach and he was the main coach. You know during during so many years, this guy I think by when I saw the, the you know the, the 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 film about his life, about um, about uh, how he was, you know, I understood why he never said hello to me, you know, because he, I think he hated his, the opponents, you know, and uh, and he was someone who I think he's got some consideration, he's got some respect, but when he's uh, when he's on you know when he's on the field, it's like you know to live or die, you know, and um, and I think he brought this. You had him at Wasp, and, and I think you were quite lucky to have him because he was he was he brought a lot, you know, into your team, into the mindset. Uh, of course, you as a captain too, but like no, this no, guy no. was really, really special. But I think the French team we really missed that. Yeah. We really missed this. You know, the someone who could speak to us with a, a different point of view, someone who knew, you know, what was the British mentality and and tell us what they think about us and how we could improve. And I think he was the man to do that. Well, there's no doubt that he um, he's he's such a humble, honest man, and he and he talks very directly to the players. Um, clearly, very emotional. I remember one one time with uh, Rafael Ibanez. He, he just joined Wasps. Uh, I think he was playing maybe his second or third game against uh, the Scarlets down in uh, uh, at Wasps, actually, the first game. We played uh, Scarlets back-to-back uh, -back games in the European Cup and uh, and we lost the first game and we did the uh, Monday morning, you know, debrief session and uh, Sean Edwards put the, uh, the, you know, the video up and a few clips and he, he really picked on on Raf, you know, and he, he just was very honest, very direct, uh, speaking in a strong Wigan accent. And uh, at the end of the uh, meeting, Raf came up to me. He said, um, "He said, what, what did what did Sean Edward say? He, he, didn't, he was clearly not very happy with me." And uh, <laughs> I said, "Raf, I said he thought we'd signed Raphael Ibanez, the captain of France, ninety nine caps." He said, "But he's not too sure who we've signed." Anyway, <laughs> the, fo the, fo the following week, we played the same team, and um, his opposite number, Matthew Reese. Uh, was was taken off the field after after ten minutes, and uh, we went on to win the game. And uh, I think as uh, as the water boy came on, he said, "Our Sean sure Edwards, who who he signed now, you know." So he was always <laughs> very 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 direct and very emotional. But, but, but what what's what's incredible with Sean Edwards is you know the technology has improved. The way I think you 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 coach the the games, you know, is very different. But this guy has gone through the ages, so it means that. Uh, 
It means that his strength is more like on, on the mental uh, effect that he could have on the players. And uh, I think that is key, you know, in, in any kind of business. And, uh, and, and, and him, you know, even if he looks like uh, you want to give him some money, you know, when he's <laughs> next to the field. But he's, he's, I think, he's, he's, uh, he, I think the, the, he, he had a massive impact on French rugby, really. It's very funny. See, I, I, I mean, obviously, Eddie Jones is now looking after England and, and he will be with us now till the World Cup. But I think one day, hopefully, you know, when France win the next World Cup, that, that yeah. you, will, you will let him come back to England and, and fulfil his ambition of, of actually coaching uh, the national team because he's, he's won everything for Wales. He's going to win everything for France. And uh, hopefully, I want to see him back uh, in England, yeah, but, 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 but it's funny to see Sean Edwards for France, Andy Farrell for England, uh, for, for, for Ireland. Ireland. Mike Mike Cat, I think. He, no, yeah. he's for, Mike Cat is for Ireland. Ireland well. or he's, yeah, he's with Ireland too. Yeah. yeah, so it's you know you got some talent and you you, you let them go. So well, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Simon, uh, if we move on to the other, I mean, you know, we move on to the Wales Scotland game. Um, it's great to see the fans back in uh, in the stadium in Cardiff. Um, I think you know it was fascinating when you when you see the teams arriving. You look at the body language, and uh, you know clearly Wales were under pressure. They had to come out with a big performance, but Scotland were, you know, after you beat the England, they seemed very confident. Maybe a little bit, a uh, uh, little bit too confident, possibly. But um, what was your view of the game from uh, from Wales' perspective? Yeah, I think if we wanted a game which typified why we all love the Six Nations, it was this, because Scotland, the week before, win a three-point game and a week later they go and lose it against a Wales team who had question marks about them after the opening game against Ireland. And for me, it really underlined with Wales how they are just a different animal when they're playing at the Principality. When they have that stadium packed out, and everyone behind them, they just seem to go up another gear. I don't know how they do it. And for me, the person who underlined it more than anyone else was Dan Bigger. You know, captain, 100th cap, absolutely rose to the occasion, slots the winning drop goal. And you saw him at full time, you know, he's a fly half, but he was bandaged up like he was sort of back row forward, you know, ice on the knee, had taken the bruises. And I think he really underlined from Wales what that performance was. And a lot of it was about heart. A lot of it was about reaction. And the message they sent um, was a big one to a Scotland team who, after that first week, I think had had eyes for being a real threat in this championship. Yeah. And Thomas, as as a uh, as a player who played fly half for many many years, you, you know you've got two of the best fly halves in the world. Um, you know Dan Bigger um, and uh, Finn Russell. I mean, you couldn't have two more different performances. Last year, last week for for Scotland against England, Finn Finn Russell was was superb, came up with all the, the key moments. And this week, I think if you clipped up all his, uh, you know, all his highlights, um, you know, it would be a completely different performance, huh? Yeah, that's why, we, that's why I love uh, Finn Russell, because, uh, he, you know, he takes some risks. And when you take some risks, sometimes, it's, sometimes it, it works, sometimes it doesn't work. You know, he's... Uh, but I, I, I always think at the start of the tournament that Scotland can do something. You know, they did really well against England, but... I think the more the tournament is going on, then you see the team, you know, they, they get tired, you know, Og as a fullback, you know, it's fantastic. They got some quality players, you know, but as soon as they have, they have some injuries, you know, I think they, they seem they seems to struggle, but on the day, you know, they can create something special. But I think on, a, on the length of a tournament, they, they are a bit disappointed. For Wales, Wales, they are, they are to turning point. They got some, uh, they had some hold forwards, you know, I think they're still at, uh, you know, a turning point in terms of um, the, the, the new generation. But uh, I think that even if the crowd is pushing hard, you know, even if this stadium is probably the best stadium in the world, you know, where, where to play. But I think that won't be enough, you know, and I think they need to find something, something more, you know, because the last few years have been unbelievable. But I think if they're, Provincial rugby is not improving. Then that will be key, you know, for them because they need to have a new a, a new start, you know, because uh, the, 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 the the national team has always hide, you know, all the difficulties of of, of Welsh rugby, and then um, before they used to have some very good youngsters, you know, under twenties, and uh, but but now it seems not to be the same, and I'm a bit. Uh, a bit um, concerned about the Welsh rugby in, in in the next future, even if. You know, they, they have some 
all the time some quality players. But um, last 10 years have been incredibly, uh, you know, incredibly well, but they never managed, you know, they won the Six Nations, but in, during the World Cup, they never managed to do something. But the next 10 years, I think, will be, will be much harder for them. I think they, um, they're obviously having a bit of a change of the, of, of the guard. You know, many players um, coming maybe to the end of their career, great players, Alan Wynne-Jones, you know, mm -hmm. Davis, you know, all these fantastic players. Tom, they, they obviously missed a lot of players with injury, but um, I think it was, for me, you know, Dan Bigger, uh, you know, I, I really like him as a player, you know, that he, you know, he's very emotional, speaks, I mean, he talks to the referee even more than I used to talk to the referee. I mean, he's, he's, a, he's a really fantastic kind of um, leader of, of his team. And it was, it was fascinating. I don't know if you saw his post-match interview. He said that was probably, you know, one of my best games I've ever had for Wales, you know, because of the occasion, because of the pressure, because all, of all the players missing. Uh, and he really stepped up. Yeah, I, I think so. I think, you know, as, as Simon says, he, he really epitomised the, the, the kind of fight that Wales, let's be honest, needed to show after what was a, a fairly embarrassing performance against, against Ireland. I think if, if you look at that game, they weren't really at the races physically. And, I, you know, I, I kind of always expected a bit of a backlash, particularly when, you know, when, you, when you're going back to Cardiff, um, Scotland have a, have a terrible record in Cardiff. I don't think they've won a game there since, since 2001. But, yeah, it, it wasn't how I, I, I expected the, the game to go. I thought Dan Bigger's leadership was outstanding. Conditions also played a part. The, the roof was open at the, at the Principality, which made for, for some sort of pretty, pretty grim conditions. Also, I think I'd, I'd call out Liam Williams. You know, he's, he's a real winner at fullback. And you, you see him do it at, at club level, at country level, at, 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 and at Lions level. So I think he, him, him and Dan Bigger showed some, some real fight and, and grit. And it, yeah, it sets up a, a pretty tasty fixture in a fortnight at, at Twickenham. And I think the, big, the, the biggest difference between the two games were against Ireland, they were smashed in the forwards. So when you're number 10 and when your forwards are smashed, when you don't win any ref, when you never have the ball, you can be the best number 10 in the world. Well, you cannot do anything, you know, but, mm -hmm. but uh, so he was only maybe on, on a, a defense. The game was only defensive from him, but against, I think, Scotland, he had more opportunity, you know, to express himself, to show, you know, how he can move the ball to, to his back line and maybe kick, alternate, you know, and, and in that game, you know, it's really tremendous. As long as the forwards, you know, are dominant, but um, it's not always the case. No, you're, you're absolutely right. Listen, he will remember that match for a very, very long time. Um, Simon, put me out of my misery here. I, uh, we're going to talk about England now. Um, I don't want to be negative because it's not in my, uh, it's not in my DNA. I always like to be positive. Um, but it, it feels like um, when you look at the development of the, of the England team, and listen, there were some positives to take out of the game. Uh, certain performances, I think, were, uh, you know, were, were very impressive. Marcus Smith again, uh, Jamie George coming back to form. Um, I thought there were, there were a number of positives. But when you look at the, the French team uh, and the Irish team and the way they've developed uh, since the World Cup in the last two years, um, you have to say that England have gone backwards and they are still going backwards at a, uh, at a rate of knots. Um, I mean, if we, if the world cup was tomorrow, I would be, um, I, I would be worried about us, um, you know, performing in that tournament. Yeah. I think the, uh, there were some positives, weren't they from England? There were moments where that attack looked like it was really flowing. I think that first try um, from Marcus Smith, where he linked up with Max Malins was brilliant. And it was interesting, actually, Marcus, Smith speaking afterwards saying he's actually been studying uh, Dupont and his running lines and how he tracks players and it's trying it's something he's trying to bring to his own game and I, I thought he marshaled the game expertly well I, I, I agree with you though there is a slight concern for me that we're sort of talking about this team as a New England you know in its infancy just getting combinations together you know Don Brandt, Randall, Smith and the World Cup is what 18 months away it kind of feels like England are at the wrong point in the cycle where you want to be, you know, you compare it to France and you look at them and you're thinking that just needs fine tuning, a few tweaks and they're ready to go, you know, full bore in 2020, 23. Whereas I feel like England have got a lot of learning to do and a lot of development to still get through. I think they can get there. You quick learners like Marcus Smith, but I think this Italy game showed how there's still a long way to go. Um, and the work is still very much a work in progress. Thomas, um, we used to look at France and, and think that they were quite confused about what they were trying to do, they, their identity. They kept changing the players all the time. 
Um, and they never really kept, uh, they never trusted players, um, you know, to, to, to do the job. They would always, always change and, and, and always play players out of position when they're playing for their clubs in, in, in a different position. Now, it feels like England uh, are confused, like the France team were a few years ago. You know, they, they always change the team. Um, I think, for me, the coach has to do two things. He has to trust a group of players and he has to have continuity in the way that they're trying to play. And I think, for me, Eddie Jones is always looking to change the game and, and think about how he can improve it before the players have actually understood what he wants them to do first, you know? So, I don't know, they, they just seem confused to me. Um, and, I mean, is that fair or, or is it unfair? No, no, I, I, totally, I totally agree with what you've said. Um, if, you, if we think about the World Cup in one year, I, it will be hard to say what will be the names on the, on, on the, on the paper for the, for the English team. Eight, you know, eight, nine, ten, you know, and then in that position... No one is really sure about what's what's going to who's going to play. Your back line, you, I think some of the players who are quite interesting. Slade, you know, is is a is a fantastic player, but he doesn't seem to be in his best uh, condi- in his best physical condition. You know, at the moment, um, got some talented players who are coming through. You know, on the wing and uh, at, 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 as 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 a, as a fullback. But um, I think something has broken. You know, in this English team, confidence is not there. You know, then they are not uh, as. Uh, um, uh, in, um, you know, they're, they're respected, but they're, they're not a threat as they used to be. You know, before you were playing against England, you were thinking, okay, uh, we need to, we need to be sure we're gonna, we, we're gonna, we're gonna be better than them on the physicality and all that. But when you play against against England at the moment, you know that they are some, they have some weaknesses. They, they're not as, uh, you know, sure about the game. You know, as they used to be. You know, they. The the, the 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 number three you know is not the, the scrum is not as strong as it as it, is, it used to be even if it was a bit better against Italy, uh, so you know uh, is it is it because you know maybe the depth the depth is not there to, in, into the into the squad because as soon as they are, you have some injuries you you know some 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 players they, they seem to struggle when they come in, in into the team. Whereas the French team now, we got we got a 15 team starting, but as I said, some of our good players are not there. You know, we yeah. miss Lakatawa, we miss Barassi. You know, in the center, we got many many options, and I think that's what Galtier has created. He has created confidence, and I think what we wanted to have is to be respected. Yeah. And I think to be respected, you need to be stronger, more powerful than the others. We're not big, we're not really tremendous as we used to be in the forwards, but I think now we really understood how we have to train to be at the best level. And I think this French team now is really uh, more dominant than that it used to be. And, and England now, I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't say that they are an average team, but they are not, for me, they're not better than Scotland or, 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 or Wales. You know, it's, it's, it's the same type of level. Ireland is a bit, is a bit above that, you know, but... Um, but playing against England, you know, in France for the last game, for example, I'm more I'm more concerned about going to Wales or Scotland than playing against England at home. No, listen, I can't I can't disagree. What they are is a team that have lost the opening game of the last three Six Nations tournaments, and uh, to do to do it once is you know is bad, but it happens to us all. To do it twice to the same team, um, you know, two years running, I think is is. Unacceptable. For yeah, me. It, it depends. What are your goals? If you want to be, if you want to win the Six Nations and won, won it not not poorly, but without a, without a Grand Slam, then okay, you you can do that. But if, if but if you do that kind of uh, of games, then you cannot pretend to be world champion if, uh, behind that. You know, it's you need you need to build it, and that's what you did. You know, in, when I, when I saw your team, you know, winning in two thousand and three, it didn't came during the tournament. It, 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 it arrived, you know, much earlier than that, and uh, you were dominant, you know, during so so many games before that. But uh, I don't see a team really who can emerge from 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 England and really pretend to win the the the, the, the world title in the next World Cup. Tom, give us uh, give us a bit of positivity here. Make make <laughs> make our listeners think that. Uh, uh, maybe with Manu Tuilangi or Joe yeah. Lawsbury or, yeah. or yeah. Courtney Laws, Tom, you know, what mm. you think, uh, you know, could happen. I mean, I guess this Wales game now becomes a really, really big game for, for England because if they win, then they can look forward to Ireland and France 
you know, with with uh, with a bit of excitement. If they lose, then it becomes a, a very uh, tough couple of weeks, Tom. Yeah, I think I think maybe we're being a little bit little bit negative after the the, the performance against Italy. You know, ultimately, if you compare the, the the France performance against Italy and the England performance against Italy, I do think France probably made slightly harder work of that 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 fixture. Um, and you know, you, you mentioned the guys that, that that are injured. I mean, you know, Courtney Laws, Joe Launchbury, Tuolangi, and Farrell are very key for that for that midfield because it means that Slade has to move to 12, which is a position he's not really played in. Joe Marchant's then um, switching between 13 and, and and the wing. So I think when we get those guys back and we get Watson and, and May back to provide a little bit of stardust on the wing that I think I think we're 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 missing. I think we'll see we'll see a much in, in, improved side. You know, ultimately Marcus Smith is is very you know in his very early infancy in terms of that that tension. Likewise with Freddie Stewart at at fullback, and I thought you know we won the game at a canter. We never really looked under threat by by Italy at all. We had the bonus point wrapped up by by half time, and these things always tend to to go in cycles. And you know we we've got eighteen months and, until the World Cup. I kind of obviously see us in 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 that build phase, but. I think there's certainly the the quality of player and the depth of 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 of, of talent within the the Premiership to to, well, to, to I, get, I, to get I was a bit I was a bit too negative. I think you're right with the names you mentioned, you know. And uh, I, I've got a small memory, you know, because I I didn't tackle so much, but you know, I don't. Really <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we have, of course, you know, these guys if they come back into the team, but 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 they look a bit, uh, you know, they look a bit at the end of their career and very like. Could can they play like four or five key games in a row? You know, at, at to play a World Cup. You know, so that's a bit my concern. They, on one day, of course, England can beat any team in the world. You know, but like when you have to play four or five games, you know, who are very intense. You know, can they really do that? Mm. Uh, well, it's uh, it, 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 there will be some hard work to be done. You know? Yeah, listen, I, I don't want to be too negative about England because I'm, I, I agree, like you, you know, it's always a bit of an anti-climax when they lose their opening match and it makes the fans feel, uh, you know, a little bit sad. And when you see some of the performances that we've seen in, in the past against New Zealand in the semi-final of the World Cup, you, you, you know, you, you know the capabilities and the potential of, uh, of that team. But listen, uh, we will get behind them um, and... We'll keep supporting them for the for the tournament, no doubt. No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> now, listen, we've talked about we've talked about all the highs and lows of the weekend's Six Nations action, but I want to put you all on the spot and just pick one player uh, who is the outstanding player uh, of the weekend. Um, Simon, uh, if I can start with you, um, you know it could be from any of the games. Who, who was the player that you stood out for you to be outstanding? Yeah, I mean, there's there's lots of candidates, not least from that that France and Ireland game, which I think was the best game of the weekend. But I'll, I'm going to give it to Dan Bigger. Um, I think because of the occasion, you know, hundredth Test appearance, captain of the side, question marks about Wales, and he really stood up and and slotting the winning drop goal and getting 15 points. I think it makes him my outstanding player of the week. And Tom, for you, uh, would it be from that game, or uh, have you uh, got something from uh, one of the other games? I was going to take a slightly different and tack and, and and choose someone from from the Premiership games, which which, which I believe will we'll come on to because we mentioned kind of the depth of players that are available to to England and in the game just prior to the England Italy game, Quinns Saracens, which was a, a very competitive game. I thought Billy Bunapola had a had a fantastic game in in the number eight shirt. He you know after a, a, a tough couple of years being in and out with injuries and in and out of England, I think he's a guy that's getting back to some of his best rugby. He was carrying very hard. He was very bruising in defence. So obviously there's a lot of um, noise around Simmons and Dombrandt for, for that shirt, but he's still a guy that I think has 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 something to offer at, at, at number eight for England. And Thomas, for you, um, <clears throat> I mean, it has to be a Frenchman, no, surely. Um, you know, they, they were, there was so many outstanding players, uh, you know, in, the, in that match. Yeah, uh, I'm going to surprise you because, uh, well, I don't understand a lot. I, I don't understand a lot, you know, the forwards games. Uh, but I know that to win a game, you need to have a very strong front five. And uh, if you don't have a very good front five, you cannot win big games. And for me, the one who has been tremendous, we didn't speak about him, was Cyril Bay, the number one for France, because he was in front of Furlong, who was considered as the best uh, number three of the world, you know. And... Uh, First of all, in scrum, you know, he was, he, he did, he did really well. He nearly over, uh, over, over, overtook him. But um, 
I think in the game it was really tremendous because when you do the hard work, when you scrum, when you do the, you have to concentrate on the line outs, you have to work, you know, and being able to make some runs and to score the try like he, like he did and to arrive, you know, with so much speed. I think this guy is really unbelievable. He came back from a knee injury, you know, two or three years ago. Every time he plays for Toulouse, he's, um, he's someone who does the hard job all the time. And, but, but he's really, I think, one of, um, even if he's only, I think, 26 or 27, he still has some gears in, in, in the tank and uh, he's really unbelievable. And that's one I would really love to have him in. He's a bit like Califano, you know, at the time, yeah. you know, this kind of player. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I'm going to stick with the front row forward as well. Uh, and I may surprise you with a, an English player, but uh, I think to see Jamie George... Uh, you know, come back to the sort of form that he, uh, you know, we know he's got. I mean, yes, it, it was Italy, but I still think, you know, he's he lost his place in the team. Uh, you know, his, his team, Saracens, went down to the championship. You know, he's had a lot of time to reflect and it would be easy to, you know, to um, to think, well, I've achieved, you know, quite a lot in my career, but I, I still think he has uh, a lot of life left in him. And I think that performance uh, at the weekend with two tries and the way he played, I think... Uh, you know, for me, it shows character in, in uh, you know, in a player to, to come back from that. So he's my outstanding player. Um, Simon, uh, obviously, the Six Nations takes all the headlines. Um, but I mean, what, you know, what else has caught your eye? What are the papers talking about other than uh, just the, uh, the three games over the weekend? Yeah, well, I mean, away from the Six Nations in the Premiership, we've seen um, Chris Ashton return back. He's now playing for, for Leicester Tigers. He's someone who's obviously got a pretty pretty impressive CV when it comes to club rugby, obviously for England as well. But an interesting move, I think, that from, from Leicester Tigers to bring him in on a short-term deal. I mean, Lawrence, you'll know Steve Borthwick very well. What do you think he's seen from, from Chris to want to bring him in? I mean, Leicester going for that title charge, is it perhaps Ashton's experience? You know, he knows what it's like to win those big games and he can, he can have an impact off the bench. Yeah, I think so. I mean, they have um, they have Nandolo, who is um, you know he's like a volcano, isn't he? Just causing uh, you know causing causing problems everywhere he goes. And I think in Chris Ashton, as you say, it's a good bit of business because um, he he he's a finisher. You know, he, he scores tries. I mean, in France, in the top fourteen, I think he he scored so many tries. Um, I mean, clearly he um, he doesn't stay anywhere for very long. I'm not sure why. You know, maybe he's um, you know, he's, he likes to just, you know, move on and on and on. But I think, as you say, for Leicester, he, he scores tries. And I think that's maybe what they, uh, they they need. If they want to take the next step, um, you know, they have a very strong forward pack, very, um, you know, good set piece, good defence with, uh, Sin, um, you know, Kevin Sinfield. But I think if you want to beat the uh, the top teams in Europe, um, you know, you, you need to score tries. You need to really open the game up. And I think with Chris Ashton, maybe, uh, maybe that's what they get. So, uh, um, any other headlines from you, Simon? Any, anything else that sort of... Uh... Yeah, just, just one other interesting bit. Is, I mean, we've been talking a bit about the World Cup and teams building towards it. Um, it was interesting to see in Argentina, Mario Ledesma stepping down. Um, you, we're, what, 18 months out to go and they're now looking for a new head coach and a change of plan. But I think some of our South African listeners might point to Razi Erasmus and say sometimes it's not the end of the world if you change your head coach. That's your outcome of the tournament. But few problems for Argentina to work through ahead of the tournament next year. Right, we're going to turn our attentions, uh, Tom, to, um, you know, your special subject, the club podcast. Um, you obviously host um, the Bath Rugby Club Plug podcast. Um, in your podcast bio, you say that you try to bring um, an honest yet optimistic account of the highs and lows and the roller coaster ride that is being a Bath fan. I think when Thomas and I were, were playing uh, many, many years ago, Bath were the outstanding team uh, in, uh, in English rugby. Um, I mean, they've, they've had a lot of problems, that, you know, in the last couple of years, but the fans have been so strong, so passionate, so patient. Um, you know, give us, give us a, li a little bit of an insight into, first of all, the podcast. You've been doing that for about four years. And, and what, you know, what the feeling is in, in the city, because, uh, you know, they've, they've seen everything this season, though. Yeah, as, as you say, it's 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 been a very very difficult season. Two out of seventeen in in all competitions, um, and and it's 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 hard. I think you know with it when you're a club in a city with the kind of heritage and history and and playing group that that that, that Bath has, it's it's you know it is it is very very difficult. Um, but I I think as you say the the support has been has been brilliant throughout that season. 
it's a uh, you you'll both have, have played there thomas and, and lawrence and it's a fantastic setting right in the in the city in the unesco world heritage site it's kind of nestled in it's a you know a very kind of intimate atmosphere and despite the results that we've had throughout the season and and you know there's been it's been record breaking for all the wrong reasons with two 70 point plus defeats a uh, 64 point defeat to leinster as well but despite all that every week it continues to be a sellout the the you know the the noise and the support from all the fans has been has been fantastic and you know despite it being a a, a really tough season and obviously it's been very difficult from a from a podcast point of view to try and keep it optimistic as as you say um do you, when, do, when, do you manage to uh, persuade some of the players to come on or are they are they running are they running away from you when you you know when you ask them to be your guest yeah, I mean, they, they weren't too forthcoming after the, the Saracen or Leinster defeats, to, to be honest. But no, I mean, over, over the last four years, you know, we're in our fourth season now, as you say, we've we've built up a really good relationship with with the club. They're very supportive and also some of the players. So, yeah, it was a big relief when we we got the victory against Harlequins at, at home a few weeks ago. And we had we had Max Ajoma to come on and, 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 and speak to him. So, yeah, it's um it, it's been great. It's something I really enjoy doing along with the along with the day job and I think obviously making big changes ahead of next season in terms of the coaching staff and, and and playing group. And so there are some some green shoots, even if they're quite hard to see at times. Thomas, what, what are your memories of playing uh, uh, down in Bath? You, I mean, you I, played for Cass, for Toulouse, for Saracen. No, I played, I played my first game for Toulouse. I think I was uh, 18, 18 just in, uh, in uh, Bath. We came to play a friendly game. We flew with, uh, and, and Steve Ojomo was still playing, you know. Yeah. I played against uh, Gus Scott, you know, who was my hero. I watched him on TV all the time. And when I played against him, I saw that he was a nightmare, you know. That, <laughs> and, uh, but what, what I don't understand from, uh, from Bath is, uh, I think we got some, I heard that they have some really good facilities for training. They, they, have, they, they improved that massively well. But even if you said, Tom, that the, the, the training ground you know it's direct you know it's it's got some you know history you know it's full all the time but i think to develop a team and i think bruce greg what he wants to create a big club if you want to create a big club like it's done in football or like we do in france because now i'm i was involved well i was involved in the last few years with uh, with to lose and trying to develop the club and help you know how to make more income if you want to make more income you need to have some very good facilities and uh, if the facilities are not improving, even if it's in the center, even if it's, you know, quite old, traditional, I think that will be all the time limited, you know. And if you don't create that, if you don't give players from New Zealand, Australia, just like the best ones to come in your club, not only because of the money that you give them, but because they have, they're going to have a massive experience, you know, playing in your, on your field. And it, I think you, Bruce Gregg needs to think about that. And if Bath doesn't change a bit, if they only stay, you know, like uh, like they were like 20 years ago, because when I saw your game against Leinster, I watched it and it was a bit painful, to be honest. Uh, I still saw the, 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 the ground where I played, you know, where uh, I think Lawrence, I, you know, and many, so many players, you know, played. And I think things have changed. And uh, I, I really believe that. Yeah, well, yeah well, I, I think the good times are, you know, they've obviously got a few changes to their coaching staff and, you know things go in cycles. I'm sure. You know we've we all, we've all had those spells. Um, and uh, I mean, is there a, a little bit more optimism? Um, you know, with the, with a few you know new new players, new staff coming into the to the club for next season. Yeah, I think so. I think we're we're now at the point where we're starting to look ahead. This this season has as has, has been very difficult, but there have been some positives to to take from it. I think particularly the academy guys, the academy players who are coming through. So I mentioned. Max Ajomo earlier in the centre, also Orlando Bailey, who is a, a guy that's really had a breakthrough season, which obviously culminated in him, him getting selected for, for the England squad. So that's been a positive. And, and also, as you say, the, the coaching changes. So bringing in Johan van Graan and JP Ferreira as head coach and defence coach, respectively, from Munster. And those are guys who have got a very, very good record at Munster. They built a, a, a ferocious defence, one of the best club defences in, in Europe, which given some of the, the score lines we've had to endure this season is, is music to all our ears. No, I couldn't agree more. Listen, we're going we're gonna to move on now to our, our little quiz uh, and try and test our knowledge of, of rugby trivia. Um, it's called Over the Line or In the Bin. 
Um, Simon, I, I think you're in charge of uh, proceedings here. I mean, I, I normally, I was normally in the bin, and Thomas was definitely over the line. So, <laughs> so, so what have you, what have you got for us? Yeah, thanks, Lawrence. So, just a reminder, guys, of how the game works. It's essentially a game of true or false. So, I'm going to give you a piece of rugby trivia, and you have to decide if you think it's true and therefore over the line, or if it's false and therefore in the bin. Uh, no prizes, unfortunately, but you will get the satisfaction of being right and also the bragging rights. Um, now, as we know, on Sunday, Ben Young's earned his 114th cap, putting him level with Jason Leonard as the most capped male player in English rugby history. But Jason Leonard has achieved a greater number of wins from his England games. Is that over the line or in the bin? Um, Tom, I'll come to you first. You can have the first crack at this. I would say, given the period he played in, I'd say I'd say that's true. So I'll go for I'll go for over the line. Thomas, what about you? What do you think? Do you think Leonard had more wins than, than Ben Youngs? Mm, yeah, I think I think so too. But uh, it's, it mustn't be too far, you know, because I think uh, I think uh, uh, Leonard maybe finished really well, but uh, but uh, but um, yeah, it mustn't be too far. But but I think Leonard has much more games started. I think for for England and as a front row, it's it's much harder. <laughs> Uh, I mean, Lawrence, you, I suspect, would have played in a fair few of these games with Jason. Um, yeah. What are you, you saying got, here? You've got to remember that when I arrived in the England team, uh, I think my first uh, training session, 1993, I think Jason already had uh, 50, 50 caps for England, you know. And uh, all I can say, I, I then spent... And, the next, and, and, uh, and he was 45 already. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I spent the next uh, 64 caps with him, um, and uh, he, he was uh, he was my my roommate uh, for for 10 years, and vice versa. So uh, all I can tell you is that every game he played, um, he used to celebrate like he won anyway. So I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm definitely gonna go over the line on this one, um, and uh, it's you know it's, let's see if we're right. Yeah, the answer is, in fact, over the line. Um, ben has featured in 79 wins, 33 losses and two draws. But Jason Leonard, in his 114 games, brought in 86 wins, 26 losses and two draws. And one try as well. You must remember that. <laughs> <laughs> against Which Argentina, I'm sure he dined out on. Against uh, Argentina. Um, listen, guys, well, before we finish, uh, I just want to have a look uh, ahead to the games um, you know, coming up in the next round of the, well, actually, there's no Six Nations games, uh, but um, let's turn our attentions to, to the Premiership. Um, Tom, I'm going to start with you because obviously Bath um, have been improving, I would say, in their in their club form. Um, you know, didn't get anything out of the WASP game, um, but they're hosting, is it Leicester Tigers on, on Saturday? Um, yeah. I guess the fans must, you know, Steve Borthwick going back to the wreck. Um, you know, obviously for Saracens and then Bath. Um, I guess the fans are they are they concerned about it? Are they, are they you know are they thinking oh my god you know we've we've played Leinster we've played you know some of the best sides and now we've got Leicester Tigers. Yeah, I, I was wondering how long it would take for you to mention the Wasps game, um, Lawrence. But I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure you enjoyed that one. At, at, least, um, at least one hour, you know. I didn't mention it at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah, as you say, it doesn't get much easier next weekend against against Le against Leicester, top of the table, flying. They 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 were brilliant on Friday night against against Northampton Saints. So it's going to be very tough. We are going to be bolstered a little bit by some guys returning from injury. So Toby Falatau made his first appearance of the season. In, in, in the game at the weekend against Wasps, but also Miles Reed and Joe Cocknessiga are, are very, very close. So yeah, that would provide a, a bit of a boost, but it's 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 still gonna be, yeah, still gonna be very tough to to turn over Leicester with the form they're in. And Thomas, uh, Thomas, when you're when you're not watching uh, you know the, the the international rugby, I mean you're are you living in Toulouse, are you are you are you a regular to go and watch the uh, the Toulouse home games or or do you, yeah. do, you do you still go back to Cast and and and, and watch Cast too? No, you know I I played in both for both teams, so I'm always concerned. And, and I watch Mont Marsan where I grew up, you know, as a kid too, because it's uh, it's like it's where you you build, you know, and, and where you you love rugby, you know, when, when you were youngsters. But one thing quite quite uh, interesting in the French Championship is um, with the stupidity to have uh, international games during 
like national season. Um, Toulouse, who was really at the top of the league with Begle Bordeaux, you know, they were leading the, 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 the league. Um, Toulouse lost, they have lost four games in a row and uh, they, because they have nine players involved in the French team. So from the team was really enjoying, you know, the, 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 the the, 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 not the tournament, but the, the division, you know, and playing really well. But suddenly, you know, from one day to the other, they, they have very good youngsters, but the other team are really strong and really powerful. And they, are, they have lost like four games. And the next game they play will be in Po. And uh, it's very important for the, in the French Championship. If you're not in the top six, you're not qualified for the, Euro, for the European Cup. So, like, some, some stupid things can happen because, because the French team takes too many players from the same club. For example, good two hookers, um, like um, uh, Marchand, Marchand and uh, Movaka, who are playing for the same club and they are selected, uh, you know, in, in the French team. So we've got some youngsters who are playing, but of course they're good, but not not at this level. And uh, and now the team is struggling. So we're, we're a bit uh, of a concern and I'm really, really want, wondering how far we can go with having this international game during the national season. For me, it's stupid. And for the crowd and for the and for the spectators, you you um, you you lie to them because you sell them some tickets for like very entertaining game, and during that game you don't have your best players. So what's the point? Well, I mean, listen, we we've been through this in in England, uh, you know, for many many years. But I guess that the trade off is that the French national team is playing so so well. Simon, what what is your uh, uh, you know, when you're not at the internationals, where where, where will you be uh, focusing your attention? Do you have to do you have to switch sports and uh, and and go somewhere else, or uh, or will you be, still be at the rugby? Yeah, I'm in a bit of football this weekend, but um, in terms of the club rugby, if anyone's in London um, and you got a chance, you got a spare Saturday, I think you could do a lot worse than heading down to London Irish v Saracens. Um, anyone who's not been to that new stadium in Brentford, uh, it is a great place to watch football or rugby and Irish are a team that had a few years in the wilderness, didn't they, at the Majeski, but back in London, they feel like a team on the up and you know, brilliant against Bristol last week. Good result against Exeter. They're a fun team to go and watch. So if, if people are at a loose end because there's no Six Nations, that would be where I'd go and spend my, my Saturday afternoon. Yeah, just cool. one thing I'm doing. I do lots of cycling, and I know you do. You do a lot too. So I'm, I'm training hard because my goal is to beat you on the bike. <laughs> Listen, you are very welcome to come. Start <laughs> I promise you, you will have no problem beating me on the bike, as you, as you had no problem beating me on the rugby pitch as well. <laughs> Listen, I'm, I'm, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure to see you, Thomas. I really do appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, and to Tom and to Simon, uh, that's all from this episode of the Rugby Podcast. Thanks for listening, but please do give us a like and leave us a review. See you all next week. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it.